Good evening. My name is Sandra Fritz. I'm the chairperson of the Shushu School Committee. Welcome to our meeting of April 22nd. Tonight's virtual meeting is being broadcast live on South Oak Channels 29 and 329 and being shown live on Shrewsbury Media Connection's website. Thank you to the work of Mark Sarah. It will be rebroadcast between now and our next meeting on April 29th. The public participation portion of our meeting is suspended as this is a virtual meeting. However, the public can uh, email questions or comments to the school committee at schoolcommittee at shrewsbury.k12.ma.us. First on the agenda this evening will be an update uh, from Dr. Sawyer and other district administrators regarding the school district's response to the COVID-19 school closing. Thank you, Ms. Fritz. I'm going to share some slides here. So if you bear with me for a moment. Okay, and you're seeing the slides on your screen, I hope. Okay, very good. Uh, well, let me begin. This was a, a, not an originally scheduled meeting, but uh, I, for the school committee's uh, wishes and, and uh, it's a good idea to continue to share information uh, more frequently as we go through this pandemic uh, situation as a school district. Uh, we do have a variety of uh, informational pieces to share with uh, the community this evening uh, and I'll begin uh, with the same key messages we've been giving uh, since we began this work during the pandemic. Uh, first of all, the health and well-being of our students and families and staff is our first priority. Uh, secondly, uh, during what certainly is an extraordinary time in history, unlike any that we've ever experienced, um, everyone in our community has a collective responsibility to respond to this challenge. And third, that even though our schools are closed, and of course now we have the information that schools are closed for the remainder of the academic year, uh, we will continue to support our students, our families, and our staff uh, from a distance and uh, true to our motto of empowering learners in Shrewsbury Public Schools will continue to empower continued student learning and staff learning as well, as you'll hear from Ms. Clowder in a bit. Uh, the new key fact uh, that we learned yesterday uh, is that Governor Baker ordered that all schools in Massachusetts be closed uh, for the remainder of the current school year. Uh, this was of course disappointing news, uh, but news that uh, virtually all of us were expecting. Uh, it is uh, of course uh, difficult uh, to even comprehend the fact that uh, we're going to lose uh, in-person uh, school instruction for essentially a third of the school year uh, during this unprecedented time. Uh, but uh, the benefit, of course, is that it gives us a level of certainty in terms of planning and understanding what needs to happen uh, over the course of, of the next uh, couple of months. Um, so I want to share a few uh, pieces of information in terms of what does being closed for the rest of the year mean for our school district. Uh, first off, uh, we have been engaged with the remote learning program. At last week's meeting, uh, Ms. Clowder gave a very comprehensive report. Uh, we'll continue to further refine that, of course, uh, and that is scheduled to continue uh, through the last scheduled day of school, which is Tuesday, June 16th. As Governor Baker remarked yesterday during his press conference, um, the closure of schools physically for the rest of the school year does not mean that summer vacation has uh, begun early. Um, and we uh, still need to be engaging our students in learning over the coming weeks. Um, it also means that our approach to our typical year-end tasks, as well as our preparation for next year, which typically is in full swing at this point and has been postponed for as we've worked through these, uh, these circumstances, uh, that needs to be adjusted accordingly. That's everything from how we are going to address the grading of all students in terms of pre-K through grade 12, how we're going to put together a schedule and class uh, assignment creation for next year, uh, how personnel processes such as hiring and evaluation, uh, budget process, uh, and all of these things, of course, many of them are interdependent. Um, we need now know that we need to do these uh, in a way that is uh, done remotely um, and done with the, the various circumstances of the pandemic in mind. Further, of course, all scheduled in-person events and activities uh, will need to either be canceled, uh, such as uh, concerts and academic and athletic competitions that we would have been uh, having during the course of the spring season. Um, I know that's deeply disappointing to our students and, and faculty and parents, uh, but that is the reality that we face. Um, or we're going to need to restructure things uh, in a different way. Uh, first and foremost among those, of course, is high school graduation, uh, as well as different award ceremonies and other things that uh, we need to be able to provide in a different way uh, to our school community. Uh, we're also going to have to look at logistical planning for things such as the safe return of uh, technology for our seniors, 
uh, textbooks for all of our students and other uh, school supplies that are borrowed right now from the school district at the end of the school year, as well as students and staff retrieving their personal effects from schools, uh, from the school buildings that have been closed. And we'll work through a plan for that and obviously communicate that when we have more information. These next couple of slides uh, are, will continue to, to look at what does being closed mean, uh, but obviously with the emphasis on what does it really mean? Um, well, first of all, it means that we need to do everything we possibly can to engage our students in order to address their well being and help them learn. It means we need to provide support for our staff. Uh, we need to make sure that we're addressing their well being, uh, that we're helping uh, them support and teach our students remotely. We need to provide support to families to address their well being um, and help them support their children. We also need to continuously adapt. Uh, we need to work as this pandemic evolves um, in order to figure out how we're going to approach next phases beyond uh, this uh, school year closure. Uh, what does summer programming look like perhaps, depending on the guidance the state issues in terms of what can be done in terms of potential in-person learning uh, during the summer months? Uh, what does it mean for the eventual return to school uh, next August or September, uh, which likely will be very different than a typical school opening? Uh, obviously, this is going to depend on how the pandemic uh, evolves and, and what uh, restrictions are still in place uh, when the next school year begins. Uh, we'll need to determine how our educational programming uh, might need to be flexible, might need to be adapted and change when in-person school resumes. Uh, that's both in order to effectively counter uh, the impact that this long-term physical closure of schools will have, and we know it will have impact. Uh, every school district in the country is going to have different kinds of impact uh, as a result of kids being out of physically out of school for such a long period of time. Um, we're also going to have to determine um, how our program will run next year when we know that experts are telling us that there's the potential for additional waves of COVID-19 that might, re, uh, might involve schools opening and then having to close again, or individual schools having to close, or people being excluded for long periods of time, depending on contact tracing and the like. Um, so we need to, to figure out how to best address that. Of course, we have some time uh, between now and the time that we'll be reopening in the fall. But this is all very intricate and technical planning that we'll have to do uh, to address something that we've never had to do before. Um, it, of course, means that we have to find suitable, alternative ways to honor our students. And that's especially our graduating seniors at Shrewsbury High School. Uh, their traditional ceremonies, of course, whether that's the senior class picnic, uh, whether that's commemoration, the, the student faculty dinner and graduation itself, um, all of those have been compromised by the pandemic. Uh, we need to determine an appropriate way um, to mark the end of our uh, students' career with us in Shrewsbury Public Schools. These are of course incredibly meaningful events, not only for our students, but for their families and for our faculty and staff. Um, and I can assure you that the leadership of Shrewsbury High School in conjunction with the district leadership uh, we'll be working together um, to uh, figure out ways to address this and working, of course, with student leaders and parent leaders um, as we try to figure out what the best way forward is with this. We do not have answers as of yet. Uh, the most important thing right now is to figure out the best way to approach this for our school community. We also need, of course, to help students, staff, and families continue to adapt. Um, there are new realities that we're all facing. It will continue to evolve. It's a fluid situation. Um, so finding ways to continuously uh, make uh, improvements on the way we're addressing this is something that uh, we'll, we will need to continue to figure out. Um, and finally, in terms of what this all means, I just want to remind everyone in our school community, uh, this is not a race and it's not a competition. This is a challenge that we need to meet as a community. Um, there's not going to be winners and losers in, in terms of how we can compare individual schools or school districts or communities. This is about finding how we can best respond to meet the needs of our students, our families, our staff um, in, in a time when we are facing unprecedented challenges. Um, and that is something that I am confident that we will do together. Uh, and uh, it is through collaboration and cooperation that we will do that best. And I'll speak more to that at the end of the presentation. So with that, um, I would like to turn it over to Noel Freeman, our Director of School Nursing, who will give a brief uh, overview of what the Department of School Nursing is doing, uh, followed by some other presentations by different administrators to bring you and the community up to speed as to what's happening uh, in our schools. And then I will wrap it up with some further comments. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Um, so just a couple of updates or some information. Um, 
along with Governor Baker's announcement yesterday, which extended our school closure through the end of the school year, we were reminded that social distancing, the use of masks, and good hygiene practices like frequent hand washing are still vital in our efforts to combat this pandemic. Social distancing may well be the most difficult of these precautions to follow, especially for our older students. Some individuals and organizations, including the World Health Organization, prefer the term physical distancing to the term social distancing to indicate that while apart, we still have the ability to make social connections and to acknowledge the importance of these connections to our mental well being. Regardless of the term we use, this need to stay apart from one another for such a prolonged period of time is difficult and, again, can be particularly challenging for our teenagers. Forging friendships and making social connections are part of the healthy development for teens, and that process has been disrupted by our current circumstances. We, the adults, need to acknowledge how difficult it is for teens to have to make such major adjustments to their typical routines and find ways to support them to ensure that they navigate these changes safely. Some ways that adults can help all children, including teens, through this time are to work together to establish routines that include healthy eating, sufficient sleep, structured time for schoolwork, and built-in breaks for things like time outside, exercise, and time to connect virtually with friends. While virtual connections are certainly impor important during this time of distancing, science tells us that teens do not have a fully developed frontal lobe, the part of the brain responsible for impulse control and decision making, and therefore teens may, may need adult guidance and monitoring of their social media activities to ensure that they are being safe. Teens are also at a developmental stage in which they feel invincible, and therefore they may not see the need to adhere to the recommended precautions, and many are aware that this virus does not seem to have the same effect on young people as it does on older adults, reinforcing their feelings of invincibility. So it's important to remind teens that they are not in fact immune to the virus and may become infected and pass the virus on to others who are more vulnerable. We need to help them to understand that their compliance with the recommendations will serve to protect others that they care about. It certainly seems like we're going to be in this fight for the long haul. Perhaps two of the most important things that we as adults can do for the children in our lives is first <clears throat> to listen to their concerns and experiences without minimizing the impact that this new reality has on all of us and partner with them to find ways to carry on. And second, to model the behavior that we want to see in our children. We adults need to practice the necessary precautions while creating new routines, taking time for self-care and finding or rediscovering ways that we can maintain the connections with others that are so important to our well being. One other quick note about the nursing department. Um, as I reported last week, our school nurse team is working with the Central Massachusetts Regional Public Health Alliance in the tracking of uh, positive COVID 19 cases in Shrewsbury, Worcester, and the other Alliance towns. To date, our nurses have done casework for approximately 130 individuals who either tested positive or were in close contact with an individual who tested positive to provide information and collect data. Our nurses are well equipped and eager to partner with our Worcester DPH colleagues to assist in this work in an effort to help flatten the curve. Thank you, Noel, and uh, we continue to be very appreciative of Noel's leadership in the work that our nurses are doing, um, and certainly want to emphasize her message about uh, physical distancing um, and helping our, our adults uh, give that message to our young people. Uh, this is going to be continue to be critically important to maintain the health of our community. Um, another department that's doing outstanding work is our Department of Information Technology. I mean, this evening, our director of IT, Mr. Brian LaRue, uh, will share some information about how we are responding to providing access to families during this period of remote learning. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Uh, so one of the first areas that we're working on um, is getting devices into the, fam the hands of families in need, uh, both families who have Wi-Fi and internet access, but not a device, 
and families that don't have internet access at all. So to date, we've issued 81 Wi-Fi iPads to families who do have internet access and 12 cellular iPads to families who don't have internet access. Uh, one thing we're working on is making contact with families who have been identified as having a need, um, but that haven't been able to pick up a device for whatever reason. Uh, so we're working with principals and school staff to try to uh, figure out what situations are uh, presenting to families. And uh, in some cases, if families don't have a transportation or if there's a quarantine issue, then we're making arrangements with our courier to uh, drop devices off to families. Um, in addition, we're working on, or we have created G Suite for Education accounts for uh, preschool through grade two students. And uh, families may be aware that we've already had students in grades three and up have these accounts. In addition to um, supporting obvious things like uh, Google Docs and, and that kind of thing that you might expect with Google uh, accounts, uh, these G Suite accounts also provide a method of single sign-on so that families can have a single username and password to use for other services like Seesaw and Zoom and, and things like that uh, and other services that we may be rolling out in the future. Um, so that that is in process. Actually, it's been completed as of this week and, and next week, families will be starting to use those accounts. Um, in grades, uh, preschool through grade four, we've uh, purchased Seesaw for schools and are rolling that out. Um, as you may know, a lot of other, a lot of existing teachers have been using Seesaw. And so this product enables us to, or this purchase enables us to more effectively support teachers, uh, allow students to carry work from year to year and uh, provide a more seamless uh, login experience and, and um, multiple class experience for families. In grades three and up, we've also been using Schoology over the past few years and, and that's been uh, helpful. Uh, in the upper grades for continuing work um, that students and teachers have already been doing uh, throughout the year. Uh, in terms of tech support, uh, IT, IT staff have been hard at work providing remote tech support for students, staff, and families. Um, it, that includes uh, helping teachers who are having difficulty with, with learning with some of the things that they're trying for the first time, um, helping students who may be experiencing difficulty with accessing assignments at home and also helping families who may be trying to access something for the first time on, on their own devices. Uh, if families do need help with uh, accessing remote learning resources, they can feel free to email uh, parent tech support at shrewsbury.k12.ma.us and our team will be glad to help uh, resolve any issues that they have with accessing remote learning resources. And finally, um, as you know, we have a one-to-one -one technology program and uh, devices can break uh, either physically or they may, mal they may malfunction. Um, so we have periodic schedule drop off and pick up windows for devices in need of repair. And uh, if a device is broken and a family needs the repair, they can reach out to the, uh, that parent tech support address and we'll be glad to uh, arrange for them to drop off the broken device and pick up a replacement device during that next available window. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I, I do want to again commend the IT department uh, under Brian's leadership and not only the specific issues about devices uh, that Mr. Liu just spoke of, but also uh, one of the things that we rely on, of course, all the time that we don't think about uh, much or, or is the reliability of our network. Uh, without a reliable network, uh, a lot of the work that would be ha is happening remotely would be very difficult uh, or sporadic. Um, and that has been a strength of the IT department for uh, many, many years in Shrewsbury. Um, and it's uh, a lot of the planning uh, to make sure that we have a robust network, not only for when we were in school, uh, but that also allows us uh, to make sure that uh, things such as Schoology and these other programs are able to work uh, in a remote setting as well. So we appreciate all the work that all the IT folks are doing behind the scenes. Um, next, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Clowder to provide a brief update. As I mentioned, she provided a very comprehensive report uh, a week ago this evening uh, regarding our remote learning program. Um, she'll just uh, hit some of the high points again in terms of things we're focused on, as well as talk a little bit about what we're doing for educator professional development. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. This first slide will look familiar. Um, it's just there to remind us that we're in this together and we're in different places. The announcement by the governor provided some certainty, 
but it certainly doesn't mean it was easy to hear. And I wanna start by acknowledging the loss that our students, families, educators, and administrators are feeling this week. I also wanna convey our collective determination to make sure that we're remedying the learning gaps that will result from the disruption to school and our determination to, to remain connected uh, in moving forward together. And on that note, this is a good time to give a shout out to our administrative professionals, both at central office and in our buildings who even remotely are helping to connect home and school and support us behind the scenes. So although our buildings are closed, teaching and learning are still alive and well in Shrewsbury. And um, these three messages continue to guide our work as we think about remote learning. We wanna make sure that families understand that we, we know on our end that the pandemic has affected families in different ways and, and presented different challenges. So we're here to support students academically and we're certainly also recognized that we need to support them social, emotionally and with mental health issues. Um, our educators are focused from an academic perspective on reviewing essential skills and providing practice for students so that they get to mastery with those essential skills, as well as teaching new content. And um, across the subjects, educators are collaborating to make sure that the content student receives is consistent across grade levels. Um, that helps us in two ways. One, it provides students consistent experiences as learners, but also, as Dr. Men Dr. Sawyer mentioned previously, we expect that we're going to see a learning gap um, because our students have not been in school and it helps us to think about how we might remediate for that going forward. And finally, we expect to see that all students will be completing assignments and participating with their teachers during live sessions. Now, that doesn't mean that students would be penalized if for some reason they weren't able to connect or if a family situation prevented them from being live online. But to the extent that families can, it's really important that students do tune in. So one of the things that's been the biggest um, need of clarity is uh, office hours. And you might be looking at that and I, I hope it doesn't make you hungry. Like what is a, is a sandwich doing on, on the screen? But I want you to pause a minute and just say to yourself, what, what would you call that? Now, some of you might call it a sub. Some of you might call it a you know, hoagie. Some of you might call it a po' boy. Um, no matter what you call it, it has the same function. It's, a, it's very filling um, and it's fun. And just in that same way, office hours for our students are substantive and they're really important. Um, they might have different names. Some people call them morning meetings. Some people call them chats. Some people call them talks, some educators call them discussions, and some people are using the term office hours. But we're finding that for young students, office hours is, can be confusing, but all, they're important at, at every level. And our educators are making sure that students have opportunities where they can respond to specific needs. So it could look like checking in, it could look like breakout groups within Zoom, it could look like um, assigning some work and then asking everybody to show up and share. Um, and it could look like structuring some small group work with or without uh, paraprofessionals. So it's a substantial part of the instructional diet and teachers expect and plan for students to show up. So if, uh, if it's possible, I think to emphasize this again, it might help us to, to um, take, tackle the notion that students have that it's, it's an optional piece. It's certainly flexible because we understand families have different challenges, but it's expected that students will show up for those um, connections. So we're asking parents and caregivers to do what they can to encourage their kids to tune in and get in touch with us if they're unable to for some reason. Um, we know, for example, that we've got sometimes there's technical glitches and, and our tech staff has been really responsive to helping families that need hotspots or, or need devices. Um, and if there's a personal barrier, we also have staff that are available to support families with that. So finally, um, I wanna acknowledge that our teachers are learning too, and they're learning in different ways. Uh, we're learning with new platforms, as um, Mr. LaRue mentioned, our elementary teachers are learning about Seesaw for Schools. 
Um, they're exploring new features of familiar platforms. So even though Schoology is familiar to our middle and high school level educators, there are some features of Schoology that are more nuanced. And there's new tools altogether in terms of new apps and, and ways to use devices to connect in a remote way um, that are things teachers are gonna be learning about during professional development. So when we think about professional development, this is where we kind of think about the opportunities that the crisis has afforded us, because one of the exciting developments for me has been that it's enabled us to think about flexible P PD modules. And when I say flexible, you might be wondering what I mean by that. I'm thinking that, you know, we've been trying to help promote the notion of a different way of doing school for some time. And yet we've been doing that within a very traditional framework of doing school. And the disruption caused by the pandemic has meant that teachers are learning techniques that will be applicable in the traditional model of school as well and help engage students, not just with an audience in their classroom, but really with an audience that potentially could be the world. So um, as learners themselves in this new environment, it's enabled teachers to think more flexibly about content delivery in ways that I think will pay dividends uh, for a long time. So, when I think about the wisdom shared by Justin Reich, who is the assistant professor at MIT, who um, lauded Massachusetts for having a really strong remote learning plan, um, I'm really struck by the part of the quote that says, for a shift in classrooms to occur, we need to dramatically increase the quantity and quality of learning opportunities available to educators in these systems, and new forms of blended and online learning experiences will be central to this growth. And that's what's going on in PD in Shrewsbury um, starting next week. So teachers can design better remote interactive experiences when they see the exchange from a learner perspective. And so district leaders, curriculum teams, and directors have used their Zoom planning sessions or their Google collaborations as opportunities to model these new skills for each other, which is what job embedded PD is. Um, but there's also a way to kind of look beyond uh, online learning and to think about how we leverage remote learning as a way to reinforce the things that were important in traditional settings. So we know that there's a lot of learning to be done, for example, simply by reading and reflecting. And I wanna pause and shout out to Aaron Palazzo and Liza Trombley for the work they've done with students using poetry, but using poetry in a way that connects them to Twitter and other students and educators across the country grappling with the same poetry. So the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education mentioned in our call with them that they'll be issuing additional guidance on remote learning and I look forward to reading it. Um, but in the meantime, we've designed professional development opportunities with relevance and user-friendly flexibility in mind, mostly so that teachers can experience that learner perspective of remote learning too. So the elementary level, pre-K to grade four, will be focused on using a new platform called Seesaw. And again, PD is optional because we recognize just as with families, our teachers have some barriers that may prevent them from tuning into professional development. Um, so we've designed it so that there will be live support sessions as an option. And also all of the live sessions, thanks to Brian and his team, will be recorded so that teachers can access them asynchronously. So um, some of the other sessions include thinking about different features of Schoology for um, teachers in grades five and up, thinking about how to facilitate uh, Zoom breakout rooms and um, other features that enable participation in a more active way during Zoom. And the piece that I think is particularly exciting is we've seen new teacher leaders emerge kind of in this area. So I wanna acknowledge Lynn Doherty and Kelly Finneran and Aaron Kendrick at the elementary level and Shauna Powers at the middle and high school level, along with numerous others, because we've seen that we've connected this professional development to planning in ways that as teachers are learning about these new tools, they can also think about how the new tools can be folded into their plans for the coming week. So in surveying the staff, it's really clear that they're interested in learning about apps that are specifically suited to supporting online learning. And so We've also thought about partnering with EdTech Teacher. It's a consulting agency that's worked with us a lot in professional development over the years. Um, and so 
the blended model allows us to grow from within by looking at outside expertise, but also to grow the strength of the teachers who have been the early adopters inside the district. So I want to close also by saying that one of the exciting things about professional development has been the dual focus on PD, both for paraprofessionals as well as classroom teachers and specialists. So our paraprofessionals are typically so busy supporting students during the day. Um, and although they are continuing to support our students during the day, especially under the guidance of um, our classroom teachers, they now have some time in their day for professional development as well. And the modules that Meg Belsito and her team have developed with the help of district leaders like Rob Perry Cruz and Daryl Reining, um, assistant principals Karen Gudekanst and Heather Goblaski and Mindy Sefton um, can also be shared more broadly with our professionals. So there's this interesting learning happening across job leg groups in ways that was not possible in a traditional environment. So we are certainly disappointed that we're not coming back, um, but we're certainly resolved that learning will continue both for our students and also for our educators. And um, it won't be easy, but I know we're in this together. And I know that um, with a shared perspective on how we can use this to grow for the time when we do come back, um, we'll be able to kind of capture some of the, the hard work that we've won from those challenges. Thank you, Ms. Clowder. Um, and as uh, you can tell, the, a lot of thoughtfulness is going into this uh, professional development planning for teachers to be flexible and appropriate to what their needs are, um, just as we're trying to do the same thing for our students in our remote learning plan. So thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, Ms. Meg Belsito, our Assistant Superintendent for Student Services, who will provide a brief update relative to what's happening uh, in the departments she oversees. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. In my recent communications, we've found that it's been helpful to staff and families to hear about the biggest highlights of the moment, day, week. Um, so tonight, here are tonight's top three for clarification and understanding. The guidance from the Department of Education during um, the school closure continues to state that individual education programs cannot be implemented as written under these circumstances, and therefore districts should develop an alternative plan for how to address students' needs during the pandemic. The department also recommended that we notify parents of how we intend to support our students by providing families with remote learning service plans, which is what families have been receiving or received electronically in the form of an N1 letter. We want to be clear that this remote service plan we shared with families that will be implemented while school is closed does not change any written or accepted IEP. And once school returns, services will resume as written in the accepted IEP. We are beyond thankful to our staff that accomplished this effort in less than a week. We are about 99% complete in sending all remote service plans to over a thousand students. This goes um, from administrative assistants who came in on alternating schedules to print and make sure that we had student record of this um, to the technology department that helped us create the process in ensuring that the emails um, were received by families. Regarding virtual IEP team meetings occurring during the school closure, the guidance we received from the department is that districts can hold virtual IEP team meetings, but are not required to do so at this time. In an effort to share our current thinking, it should be noted that our schools have not moved into um, this phase yet, but we are working through the many details of how that might be accomplished. And we will continue to communicate with families if and when we do intend to hold virtual uh, meetings for IEPs as well as 504 plans. Uh, next slide. There are a number of things to consider when thinking about guidelines for meetings. Things um, that we are thinking about and we're working through right now are teachers balancing work responsibilities and their own personal family needs. The privacy and the confidentiality of people being in their own homes with their families, which our legal guidance has told us that we will, we will need consent prior to these meetings to be held. Increase in expectations for special education teachers, coordinating team meetings with large numbers of service providers, prioritizing which types of meetings can and cannot be held. Things like transition meetings when students are moving from grade level to grade level or building to building, annual review meetings, independent educational evaluation meetings. 
things about things that we're um, talking about is being able to fit the number of meetings required into the available time slots and schedules. Just at our middle school level alone, under normal circumstances, IEP meeting blocks are 15 to 20 class periods per week. In this environment, we're looking to identify five blocks per week. We will not be able to include current performance since the students are not with us and we won't be able to assess current performance in a remote learning environment. We are thinking of ways to progress monitor and collect data as our students are working from home. But again, this is another hurdle that we continue to wonder and think about ways in which we could do this in, in a different way than what we typically would. Will families be able to meaningfully participate in meetings with their work and their own family responsibilities? Holding a meeting about an in-school IEP during school closure will be a challenge. It will be hard to separate the remote service learning plan from an in-school IEP, which are two very different things. Next slide. As another example of the complex complexity across our district, just at the pre-K level alone, this slide depicts some of the various pieces to early childhood transitions. We should be attending virtual transition planning conferences, accepting referrals from early intervention programs, reviewing early intervention assessments for our young children turning three, the consideration of the individualized family service plan and collaboration, co collaboration with early intervention providers. And lastly, Here is a letter from Russell Johnston, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education Senior Associate Commissioner of Education that was sent to families just last night. This letter outlines much of what already has been communicated over the past month, but the department has requested this letter be shared with families again for clarification and support. Lastly, and it should be noted that part of our work right now is to develop guidelines for various things that I've just spoken about. And there are three levels of legal authorities that we deal with prior to any guidance or implementation. The federal requirements, the state requirements in Massachusetts general laws, and finally the Department of Education's regulations and policy. After all of that, it then comes down to the local level. Our next steps, we do anticipate guidance from the US Department of Education as the state consults with stakeholders about all of our good faith efforts, what's reasonable during the school closure, and most importantly, how do we ensure equity for all students? And that's it. Thank you, Ms. Belsito. Um, I do wanna offer my thanks uh, to the members of the Special Education Student Services Department uh, for uh, the remarkable work they've been doing uh, under difficult circumstances, both uh, working to try to provide support for our students who have a variety of, of uh, challenges in terms of their remote learning, uh, but also this massive amount of paperwork that's been required. Um, special education is one of the most heavily regulated uh, enterprises anywhere, um, and that certainly hasn't changed. And if anything, it's increased uh, given the, the circumstances that uh, Ms. Belsito just described. Um, so I appreciate the work that our special educators have been doing to, to meet these challenges. At this point, uh, I'll ask uh, Dr. Lazat to talk a bit uh, about um, a, a very uh, interesting and, and so far very successful uh, program, um, engaging our alumni. That's one of our, our goals and our strategic priorities, um, as well as to talk about an event coming up uh, to focus on well-being among our uh, staff and families in our community. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer, and thank you everyone for offering this opportunity to share a few things that have been going on. Um, most importantly, uh, and uh, I would say what has been very exciting over the past few weeks is planning this uh, SHS student and alumni mentoring program with Kathleen Cohane and Michelle Biscotti. And thank you to Brian LaRue for his Zoom help <laughs> as well. Um, the goal of this program is to provide Shrewsbury High School students regular and structured opportunities to engage in informal discussion, exploration, and information sharing with graduates of Shrewsbury High School about life after high school, exploring potential opportunities for work, career, and continuing education in light of the individual students' interests, curiosities, strengths, and skills. 
And as you see here on the slide, the, um, the hosts are Kathleen, Michelle, and I, minimally two of us are part of each of these, um, the meetings held between the students and the alumni. The panelists are SHS alumni, and I should add, we have a few students who are participating too today who are currently seniors in college, um, who are also engaging in the program. The participants um, are the students. We had uh, 13 last Monday registered, and as of today, we have 95 students who are participating in the programming. And there are 14 featured programs uh, listed on the next slide. Thank you. Um, the programs are listed here. We, over the weekend, we, Kathleen and Michelle and I had two mentor trainings, um, one on Sunday afternoon and one on Monday morning. Um, we had an opportunity and alum had an opportunity to talk together, uh, share ideas about what these meetings uh, may look like and what to expect from our students um, as far as questions and suggestions and explorations go and uh, those training meetings went um, very well. We then started our meetings on Monday with students. Uh, two meetings were held on Monday, um, three on Tuesday, three today. Uh, we have four taking place tomorrow and four on Friday. And we told the students and the alum that the meetings would run between 20 and 60 minutes. Um, and as of now, they've run a full 60 minutes and a uh, few have gone over time. Um, so there's a lot of learning that's happening. There's a lot of sharing going on between um, alumni and students. Kathleen um, and Michelle send out surveys following the hour long programs and we've received uh, very positive feedback as of today, all students and all alumni wanna continue um, the programming and look forward to further opportunities um, beyond uh, this week. So th that's what we'll be working on next. Um, the survey also asks students and alumni for additional ideas. Um, students have asked um, if there are SHS graduates, so SHS graduates tune in, who um, have alternative options to college that they can share with current students. Students are also looking to learn more about public service and trades, including plum plumbing, electrical, and construction. Um, students are also looking to learn more about how to finance college, di different options uh, for students, as well as financial literacy. Um, so no one has been shy <laughs> as far as sharing ideas. The schedule of the meetings and um, the links to the meetings are on the Colonial Fund page under alumni for those of you interested, again, in seeing the offerings that are um, taking place currently. We've had students, as I say, at, um, join in the meetings each day. Some um, who just decide at the last minute, um, like today, we had a voice and theater uh, meeting and we had. Um, students join in who, and alum actually, um, within the past 48 hours. So it's just been very uplifting. And um, again, I look forward to continuing the work with Kathleen and Michelle. Um, we're so grateful to the students who at the end of their school day are um, tuning in. And here's a um, snapshot of, um, screenshot rather of a meeting that took place yesterday um, as you we have four alum um, actually one student Michael O'Connell still in college at Brown University um, and we have other students here who shared experiences from the Peace Corps internship experiences one of the alum um, shared with the students that she didn't go to college right away she went um, 
three years following college because she was looking for a way to fund college, um, not have to pay for her studies. And thus far, she's been very successful doing that. Um, so students, please join in. We welcome you, we value you and um, your participation. Alum, please check out the Colonial Fund website, uh, the alumni section of that. And if you would like to get involved, contact us. There's information there. Um, we look forward to Mr. Collins joining in on Friday, a military and um, ROTC webinar uh, with a former, another graduate, uh, Keith Belanger from the class of 1984, who has spent a lot of time outside the country with his family um, in the military and is now um, working um, in the business field. So stay tuned and thank you for allowing me to share that this part of uh, the presentation. The ne next piece here is an invitation um, to the entire Shrewsbury community. Um, Lisa um, Arteca, the, one of the nurses at Oak, along with the team listed, he, listed here, has created an opportunity uh, for the Shrewsbury community to participate in a virtual 5K on the weekend of May 1st through May 3rd. All information is in the community bulletin um, and the principals are also sending out the information. It's called Rise Up Together Virtual 5K. And again, all are welcome and included. This is an opportunity to be together though we are apart. And uh, thank you to Lisa, uh, Ann Jones, Jeff LaRose, Karen Keenan, Sorry, um, Noel Freeman, thank you. Maureen Pilizari and Jeff Lane for their leadership and coordination of this event. I would also like to thank Steve Genentasio and the Sneakerama crew who are um, offering coupons to all participants as well as some um, prizes that will be drawn through a lottery. We're all winners in this event. Um, so this is an opportunity to complete 3.1 miles of physical activity at any time during the weekend of the event. Participants can walk, run, hike, bike, yoga, skip, jump, engage in any of your favorite fitness activities inside or outside. Um, and again, if you're not able to complete the 5K, um, try to complete 30 minutes or 15 minutes if that is an appropriate goal for you. Um, the goal really is to be together doing something that makes us um, feel good and is good for us. And we ask that you practice, I uh, guess, I should be saying physical distancing, physical distancing, um, according to Ms. Freeman. If um, anyone is interested, we're going to, we have a Padlet link uh, for you to upload pictures that's ready to go and that will be sent to all participants. And again, thanks to Sneakerama for sponsoring the event. I encourage everyone to get involved. Thanks, Dr. Sawyer and thank you, school committee. Thank you, Dr. Lazat, and uh, I'm very excited about the uh, this inaugural week of uh, alumni providing some mentoring opportunities to our, our current high school students. I think it's a terrific uh, opportunity. These are the kinds of things we envision when we started to work on that goal. And we appreciate your work, and uh, along with uh, Kathleen Cohen and Michelle Biscotti, to make that happen, and to all the alumni who are participating. Um, and also, certainly, we'll get the word out, continue to get the word out about the virtual 5K. That's a, an innovative way for us to try to come together as a community and also uh, model the importance of exercise uh, for our families and especially for our students. Uh, our last piece here before I wrap up is uh, uh, an update from Mr. Collins regarding the current fiscal year and next fiscal year. Um, and I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Collins at this time. Hey, thank you, Dr. Sawyer. So uh, just a brief update on uh, fiscal matters. And I'd like to break this into uh, two different sections uh, since we know that this pandemic is gonna transcend uh, multiple fiscal years. Uh, so first for the current fiscal year, fiscal 20, uh, certainly with the news uh, around school closures being for the entire year, we have certainty around that uh, now. And that allows us to um, do several things uh, first is uh, the implementation of a uh, budget freeze, uh, which would uh, restrict any kind of future procurement uh, for the remainder of the year uh, to only those must-have supplies or services uh, that we need to uh, 
uh, carry on the educational enterprise and then uh, shut off the valve, if you will, for other uh, discretionary types of uh, purchases. We had actually uh, had uh, done something uh, as kind of a first phase earlier in March. So this kind of just kind of clamps it down a little bit further. So we'll be rolling that out uh, shortly. Secondly, uh, we're able to now reforecast uh, more precisely our uh, expenditures for the remainder of the fiscal year and uh, reforecast what we think our, um, our end position is going to be. Uh, certainly we need to um, try to assess uh, what some potential new expenses might be between now and the end of the fiscal year. Um, we've had some already. I think my first report to you, we were at about a $48,000 threshold of COVID-19 related expenses. And now uh, with some additional software purchases, uh, we're just over $61,000. So we'll continue to try to anticipate what uh, things are gonna come our way between now and the end of June 30th and factor those into uh, the year end expenditure uh, forecast. A couple of topics that still are open-ended um, lots of information uh, kind of flowing in, flowing out on a daily basis. Uh, and we'll provide some more information to the school committee uh, in succeeding school committee meetings, but uh, certainly for the topic of school transportation, we're still working on a uh, contract amendment, again, to ensure their viability uh, for uh, services uh, for when we do reopen school. This is a statewide effort, again, to ensure that um, the small number of bus companies that do exist in the Commonwealth are uh, maintaining their fleets and uh, their employees and the readiness status to uh, service uh, our needs when we do reopen. We'll again, be looking at all the tuition and fee-based programs uh, that we have and our status with those uh, for the current fiscal year. And then again, uh, a future uh, recommendation around uh, pay continuity at your next meeting on uh, April 29th for the hourly staff. So those are uh, uh, some of the things that are we're doing now with respect to the current fiscal year. Um, next fiscal year, of course, we know, um, and uh, like other communities around us, again, this is not something that we're in uh, this endeavor alone. Uh, our surrounding communities, uh, surrounding school districts, uh, and uh, town managers will be recasting their budgets, as will our town manager. Uh, I know that uh, we've had some conversation about uh, he'll be reforecasting the revenue projection for next fiscal year, um, taking into account uh, likely lower revenues for uh, local receipts and some sort of projection what will happen with state aid. And we know that the state legislature had uh, another convening to try to gain a consensus a revised revenue estimate for state revenues. Uh, and it looks like they were predicting, you know, in the neighborhood of about a $4 billion decrease or around about a 10% decrease. So we still have yet to see what the details of that might be in terms of K-12 education and then how that might roll out to impact uh, Shrewsbury. So those things that will happen in the future. Uh, certainly the budget decision-making timeline uh, we expect to hear more information next week with respect to the town election in the annual town meeting, which were uh, postponed to later dates. Um, and we'll have to react to those uh, new dates once we learn what they are. When we left off the budget development process for fiscal 21, which seems like a long time ago now, um, we were at this point of uh, making some pretty significant staff and program reductions and uh, uh, setting fees for uh, next year's uh, services and tuitions. Um, and at the end of that, we were still had a, a $435,000 budget gap that needed to be closed. Um, and certainly we know now that uh, with an expected decrease in uh, revenue overall, that that gap is uh, definitely going to grow. We just don't know what that amount would be. So um, we'll have to work through that in the coming weeks. And, you know, if it's, uh, for example, if, you know, the town meeting is postponed to a later date sometime in uh, June, for example, before the summer break, uh, that would mean that we would need to uh, develop a revised uh, 
a budget recommendation for the school committee uh, in the coming weeks and act on it fairly quickly uh, in order to uh, meet the deadlines for uh, example, a, a late uh, June annual town meeting. So uh, it will feel like a, uh, a quick finish if that is the timeline. But again, we're just kind of taking it day by day and uh, week by week. Um, and we do want to also note that uh, it, with respect to you know, the K-12 CARES Act, the federal stimulus money for K-12 education. Uh, again, it's been reported by the state that the, the state's allocation is gonna be about $210 million for that particular stimulus program uh, that will flow th through the state to school districts. And uh, my initial guesstimate, we have no information yet from the state, but based upon the allocation formulas they've used uh, before, you know, our share might be in the range of $160,000 to $170,000, which is not a large sum of money in the context of our overall budget. Um, and we're going to have to find a way uh, uh, to factor into the fiscal 21 budget uh, some measure of budget resources to deal with uh, reopening schools in a uh, still in a COVID-19 environment or, you know, a post-closure uh, reopening and that's going to certainly take some additional resources or expenses we're just not really sure exactly what that might be whether it's staffing or equipment or supplies um, and trying to discern the best way to uh, set aside funding for that as part of our fiscal 21 plan so that we don't come up uh, short uh, when we reopen in in august uh, so that's the uh, update with respect to where we are in uh, the fiscal matters. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Uh, I continue to appreciate Mr. Collins' uh, excellent work uh, in terms of the forecasting that he's doing and looking at all the various angles uh, around uh, the various elements of school finance uh, and management of operations that are being affected by the pandemic. Uh, so thank you to him and his team for the work that they continue to do. Uh, this is obviously sobering information. Uh, and I think that it's, uh, critical that we uh, look uh, with uh, very uh, uh, with clarity and open eyes at, at the realities that we have to face, uh, not only in the short term with the uh, pandemic and the school closure, but what's going to be going on beyond the short term into next year and beyond. Um, and so in wrapping up the report, uh, I do wanna uh, speak to uh, the issues of, of both uh, the challenges we face um, and the, the fact that we need to maintain our hope uh, of things that are going to get better in the future. Uh, we know these challenges are formidable. Um, we, I believe that at least for the next two years, they're going to have a very significant effect on how we operate as a school district, whether that's because of the COVID-19 uh, situation itself relative to schools being closed, the potential for additional waves of the illness to come uh, in the coming year where we may reopen in some fashion then have to close again, depending on how the epidemic is, or the pandemic rather is, uh, is spreading. Uh, hopefully um, the, the best minds in the world of course are working on whether it's a vaccine or issues around how to safely uh, maintain society in, in the face of this, uh, but obviously that all remains to be seen. Uh, we also have these very, very significant fiscal issues. Uh, we already had an extremely challenging budget uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, and now, as we would say, post-COVID, uh, we know that the lack of revenue is going to create uh, a very significant uh, fiscal cliff uh, that we're going to have to uh, deal with in terms of uh, not having the kinds of resources that we would prefer to have uh, to, to keep our program going the way that it is. And it's going to require some reductions. We just do not know the extent of that yet. Uh, I hold out hope that as, during, uh, as happened during the Great Recession, that the federal government uh, does uh, provide additional stimulus beyond perhaps the hundred or two hundred thousand dollars we might get out of this first round. Uh, you may recall back when uh, the Great Recession happened, there was very significant, uh, well over a uh, million dollars worth of federal stimulus that came into the district that really uh, helped us maintain a lot of program that otherwise would have been cut at the time. Uh, but again, that remains to be seen whether that will happen or not, and we'll have to deal with things as they come. Um, I think it was important to. Uh, or, or certainly reminded me uh, of the Stockdale paradox. Uh, I raised this uh, actually at the beginning of our budget presentations uh, back in January. Um, the Stockdale paradox is based on what the author of the uh, uh, classic organizational leadership book, Good to Great, uh, written by Jim Collins, 
uh, his, uh, what he learned from Admiral James Stockdale, um, who uh, the late Admiral was uh, a prisoner of war in Vietnam. Um, and when he interviewed him, he talked about the realities um, that the prisoners of war uh, who were able to sustain themselves and ultimately uh, persevere and prevail and uh, survive and uh, when the war was over, uh, come back uh, after that, uh, really had certain characteristics. Um, and interestingly, Admiral Stockdale uh, told Mr. Collins that, uh, one of, that uh, the people who fared the worst uh, were the optimists. Uh, which uh, the, the author thought was uh, was interesting, didn't quite understand. And when he asked him more about that, he indicated that the optimists were those um, who kept uh, wishing, uh, and and that uh, you know at the next uh, particular holiday, perhaps if it was Christmas or by the Fourth of July, they were going to get out. And when that holiday passed, um, and they still hadn't got out, gotten out of the prisoner of war uh, prison, uh, that they would they would start to lose their hope and faith uh, that ultimately they would prevail. Um, and you can see on the slide um, that what Admiral Stockdale said is that you have to maintain that unwavering faith that ultimately um, you will prevail in the end, uh, regardless of whatever difficulties you face. But at the same time, you have to have the discipline to confront the most brutal facts uh, of their current reality, whatever those facts happen to be. Um, and so I think that we're in that situation right now, and it's important that we continue to make sure we're providing you, the community, uh, with the facts as we know them. Uh, whether or not uh, they are uh, facts that would like to be realities or not. Um, and so finally, uh, it reminded me also when I read this uh, interview yesterday that was in the New York Times um, that the columnist Thomas Friedman did with uh, Dove Seedman, who is a, a leader in the business field, um, talking about uh, the difference between hope and optimism. And you can see the quote there uh, where he says that the true antidote to fear, and of course we all have fear, uh, right now in terms of whether it's the pandemic or what the effects are going to be on ourselves, our families, on society, our community. Uh, but the, the, the best antidote is not optimism, but really it's hope. And that when you are hopeful, it brings out the best in people. It inspires collaboration. It inspires a common purpose. It inspires our thinking about future possibilities. And when we do that, uh, when we have hope, it helps over overcome that great fear and it helps us meet the kind of challenges that we face now. Um, so I think it's critically important as a school community um, that we uh, continue to maintain our hope while still recognizing that we have some sincerely very brutal and difficult facts that we're going to have to address in the coming weeks, months, and years ahead. Um, and with that, uh, we'll turn this over. Thank you to my colleagues for their comprehensive report this evening. Um, and I'll turn it back to our, our chair, Mrs. Fritz, to see if the committee has any questions for any of us. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer and everyone for the reports. It was excellent. And I think it's um, it's always good to update the community on uh, what's happening in our schools. And this is a huge undertaking we haven't done before. I'll turn it over to um, the rest of the committee. Are there any questions or comments? John. Uh, thanks, Ms. Fritz. Um, yeah, just a, a big thank you again to our district leadership. That was a great presentation. Uh, I know we've seen uh, presentations each of the last three weeks and, and just uh, get better and better and, and very challenging times. So thank you for the continued focus on, on remote learning and, uh, you know, keeping our students and staff safe and engaged. Uh, Brian LaRue and tech support as well. I mean, we're, we're very dependent on technology right now to make this a reality. Uh, as well as Selco. Um, I mean, from my perspective, very few network issues uh, and, and things have been working well. And to our teachers, you know, certainly uh, for their continued support and creativity and supporting our students. Uh, we continue to be in uncharted territory. Uh, I do like the slogan that Ms. Clowder shared, and I did see it on social media yesterday. I think it's very important to put in perspective <clears throat> that uh, school is not closed for the year. Uh, the buildings are closed. And I think I was at a point last week where I just I couldn't see <laughs> returning to school buildings under the current climate. I think I was in mourning by Thursday, thinking about what might be coming this week. And, and sure enough, yesterday was very difficult. I know for a lot of families to hear you know, the finality of the gov governor's announcement, I think it was very uh, challenging. I know for me, and, and no matter what age your student is, going into school is, is much as much about learning as it is about uh, being social and being with your friends. Uh, and I've said it over the last several weeks, you know, I'm certainly a parent of a, of a high school senior uh, and for, for our SHS seniors, especially, this is their final year in, in uh, Shrewsbury Public Schools. And uh, as a parent, uh, you know, yesterday was a challenge. Um, it is important to find certainly creative ways to honor our senior class and, and other student achievements as well. And, and I agree with Dr. Sawyer, 
this isn't a race or a competition to get to a certain point in that space. I think it's it's going to take some careful consideration uh, and taking a measured approach, you know, to what is possible, you know, what works best for our students, our district, uh, and you know what's within our capacity to to successfully execute. So again, you know, thank you for the presentation and, and the continued support. Anyone else have any comments or questions? Jason. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Fritz. Uh, a, a comment and, and then a question. My comment I'll keep brief uh, because I certainly don't want to belabor a point that I've made uh, repeatedly in the previous weeks in our in our preceding meetings. But uh, I just want to extend my thanks to the leadership team of this district and indeed to every staff member of Shrewsbury Public Schools up and down the line. I continue to be impressed by all the work that you do. Uh, this crisis has validated the faith that I've always had in this leadership team and in our staff. Uh, so thank you everyone. I've been impressed uh, by your ability to react quickly and effectively to a pandemic that has no precedent, uh, certainly in modern times, and uh, there is no playbook for what you're doing. And so I'm impressed by everything that you've managed to achieve. Uh, my question is uh, for Ms. Clowder, and I'll admit before I ask it, it's an extremely loaded question. So after <laughs> after after safety, obviously, my top concern is going to be the long term impacts on learning uh, that this has. And I recognize I'm going to ask this question barely a day after we got official word that schools aren't going to be re reopening for the rest of the year. But you know, in the four phases, Ms. Clowder, that you had outlined for remote learning, sort of the, the last phase, phase four, looking ahead, when you had mentioned in your remarks that we are expecting to see a learning gap. Uh, and I guess my loaded question is come fall, assuming we're back in the classroom, assuming things are at least in terms of physical occupancy of the building and attendance back to normal, how will we assess and address this gap? I'm assuming will there be some remedial time or attention given to, to maybe some development or learning that didn't occur? What do you feel at this early game the fall looks like and what kind of planning might we be doing for that now? So I think the that's a that's a presentation unto itself. Um, <laughs> but I think, but the the short answer is I wouldn't wait till the fall. We're already looking at um, ways we can assess the kids that might be most at risk, and what are some ways we can facilitate kids holding on to regular practice, and and are there some online platforms that can kind of fill some of those needs? Um, it's certainly I don't think we're expecting to pivot to an online learning piece, but we were thinking about how we could leverage the summer in the ways that we always think about, you know, summer reading and summer practice activities to prevent against regression. What would that look like in a new environment? Um, so that's been top of mind for our teachers for some time, whether we were coming back or not. And I think that's where the certainty helps us pivot to do some of that planning in more depth. Thank you. Appreciate that. Lindsay? I um, certainly would, uh, would agree with the comments already made. The, the level of transparency, I think, is more important than ever uh, as people are clinging for what is certain. <laughs> uh, and so um, as, as much as I enjoy our, our now we, you know, weekly sessions with all of you, I think they're important for our community uh, to know what, what you're all thinking, where you're going. And I want to just commend that we we keep that going um, as people are really seeking. Um, you know, we we know that people didn't always used to come to school committee meetings. I know some people would watch us later, and we also know we have hundreds of people who tune in now because uh, there. I think there's a real appetite to to get more information, and I and I think that's an opportunity for us. Um, so I appreciate all the the emails and all the different ways, but this is an important one. So thank you to to all of you for for sharing um, and that we we keep that going. I also do think that as a as a community, we have to figure out how to get um, some public input in this process as well, as we think about the complicated issues that um, Mr. Collins brought up about our budget. Many, of the, all of us here knew with the, these 12 boxes, we all knew what we were facing and that there were gonna be some real, real big problems. I'm not sure our entire community had yet tuned into that reality and um, it's gonna become, as, as we said, even more acute. So figuring out how the public can participate in some of our means, I think is an important piece for us to continue to add in as we as we continue to adapt and, and, and evolve um, because there's gonna be a lot of really difficult decisions um, coming, coming down the pike. So thank you all very much. 
Dale. Just a quick question for Ms. Clowder, and that uh, relates back to uh, Jason's remark. Uh, do we have a way of monitoring uh, which students are and which are not accessing our online resources and which resources for how long do we have uh, some means of essentially taking attendance and, and trying to see what's being accessed and what isn't? In every building, teachers are working with principals to um, target families that they haven't heard from and or students that they're concerned about. Um, what we've been doing this week is trying to build a master district list of all those individual building lists and think about particularly the needs of um, special populations like families that don't speak English, whether or not they have an English learner at home. And so how could we you know, leverage either our own internal um, staff that speak more than one language or language services if needed to kind of do some outreach based on that. Um, so that, that master spreadsheet will help us to target resources better, but we're actively doing that right now. Does does the electronics that we're using accommodate tracking access? Certainly, that with students that have the one to one, uh, and mm -hmm. I would let Brian take that issue. Um, he's the he's the technical expert, but um, the trick is with students that don't have that one to one device. Yeah, yeah, I can I can actually break in here as well. I, I think that uh, you know there are some software programs that we do have. Uh, the Alex program at the, uh, that we use for mathematics at the high school level, for example, uh, that gives uh, teachers very detailed information regarding to the various, that's an artificial intelligence type program. It, it can show which kind of problems uh, different students attempted, how well they did on them, how much time they spent um, in the program on a day-to-day on a -day basis or each time that they log in. Uh, we have a program at the elementary level called Lexia. Uh, which is a reading literacy program that we had been piloting earlier this year on a limited basis um, to uh, very, very positive uh, reactions to it. Um, and we are uh, looking at potentially rolling that out uh, on a wider basis. Um, and uh, I have actually uh, additionally tasked Mrs. Clowder to work with her curriculum team and with Mr. LaRue and his team uh, on whether or not there are any other options out there um, that we may want to look at uh, now that we have the certainty again, that uh, we will not be coming back physically to school this year. Um, we may want to think about uh, some additional investments in uh, software if it were to be appropriate and meet some of our learning goals. Um, Mr. Collins spoke of a, you know, a budget freeze other than what we need to do around uh, delivering the, on the educational enterprise. And uh, I do think that we may need to make some expenditures for some potentially some additional software in addition to what we purchased the licenses for Zoom and for Seesaw. Uh, but maybe for some specific academic software, if we think it's a good match and a good fit and can provide us with some of that feedback. Um, it also may get at, uh, you know, Mr. Palich asked about and, and Dr. McGee amplified, uh, which is uh, being able to uh, do some assessing, uh, obviously assessing student uh, uh, when we're not here physically is more difficult. Um, students are turning in work, of course, uh, that are assigned, assigned each week and, and teachers will be evaluating and providing feedback on that work, but it's much more limited than what would happen during the normal course of school. Um, so it's something we are definitely paying attention to. We'll have to look at what financially uh, the impacts might be. Uh, similarly, in terms of the English language uh, education piece, um, if we need to provide some more resources for interpre interpreters or uh, finding ways to connect with our families whose first language is not English, that may be another area of expense that we experience before the end of the fiscal year and that we may need to build into next year's budget to some degree. Um, but other than that, I don't know if Mr. LaRue has any technical uh, thoughts on some of the software pieces. Yeah, some of the platforms like uh, Schoology and Zoom allow teachers to run reports in terms of who's checked in, who's, who's logged in to view uh, their courses and, and join their meetings. Uh, so teachers are starting to uh, to do those kinds of reports as well to see who's been checking in and, and maintaining contact. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Anything else from the committee? That was good. I also want to thank um, you again. I think we know we have a really hardworking and talented uh, senior leadership team, but it's very apparent in a crisis like this. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing. And I really want to um, thank you, Brian, because Without IT, none of this would be working. I think IT makes us all go around. So you're very humble. And I think uh, the work you're doing behind the scenes is really creating the ability for this to online learning, for all of us to be able to interact is wonderful. So thank you very much. 
Dr. Sorry, anything else on this topic? Oh, thank you. I certainly underscore those remarks and appreciate the, uh, the remarks that committee members made. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a leadership team. I, I also want to certainly uh, give a shout out to our principals um, who are managing this on the front lines mm -hmm. with their staffs and, and the families and their school communities, our assistant principals, all of our directors as well, um, and curriculum leaders uh, who've been working uh, so hard behind the scenes to get all of this up and running. Uh, obviously, we can't uh, possibly do the kind of work from a, a limited uh, uh, level here at, at central office. So um, it's been a team effort. And then ultimately, of course, our educators and support staff are putting this all into place. Uh, this is called a reference tip, but just to remind everyone, today is uh, Administrative Professionals Day, and uh, we do want to recognize the work that our secretaries and all of our clerical support staff and administrative professionals do. Um, and uh, as I communicated to the uh, to our district staff uh, earlier today, in acknowledgement of this uh, of this recognition, uh, you know, we know that they're certainly the lifeblood in making things work on a day-to-day -day basis. And when we're not in school, I think that becomes even more apparent how important they are to the culture and the climate of what we do. Um, and so to all of our staff, again, uh, just my gratitude for the hard work and effort um, and uh, skill that they're bringing to all this work. Great, thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, Dr. Uh, Sawyer will provide his recommendation to continue uh, funding of the Aspet Valley Collaborative Services during the school closure. Thank you, Ms. Fritz. And I, I know Ms. Heffern just referenced how important transparency is, particularly when we're working through a crisis. And uh, I think this is an example of that. Uh, you have a memo uh, in your meeting packet uh, that I will summarize and then be happy to answer any questions. Um, essentially, uh, as we've talked about over the last several meetings, uh, the Commissioner of Education, Jeffrey Riley, uh, from the beginning of this uh, pandemic has emphasized um, the state's uh, strong uh, recommendation that local districts continue uh, to provide financial support, not only for their own employees, uh, but also for uh, organizations that contract with school districts. That includes bus companies, it includes out of district special education schools and organizations uh, such as our local collaborative, the Aspen Valley Collaborative, of which we're a member. Uh, that is something that uh, is in order to make sure that uh, these uh, really critical organizations uh, don't experience a, a situation due to the financial pressures uh, that they're not available uh, to districts when things open up again. Uh, and, and now that will be looking to the fall, of course, for that. Um, for those who may not be familiar, the Aspen Valley Collaborative, it was uh, founded in 1976. Um, there are several collaboratives around the state and what educational collaboratives are, are a, uh, a consortium of, of uh, school districts in the same geographic area um, that work together uh, through this organization um, in order to um, create opportunities for services that would be more expensive and less efficient um, if the school districts were doing them on their own. Typically, these are uh, very specific special education services as well as special education transportation. It also involves professional development or job-alike groups. Uh, um, and the Aspen Valley Collaborative is one of the, the highest quality collaboratives, I believe, uh, in the state. They do an excellent job. Uh, the superintendents of the member districts serve on the board of directors. So I serve to represent uh, Shrewsbury. Um, and this past Friday, uh, the uh, collaborative met and the board of directors discussed. And of course, the reality is that um, the, the districts not only are members of the collaborative, but they, they are, are, so therefore they share uh, in its, uh, uh, the, the fiscal viability of the collaborative organization itself. It's, it's really part of what we do. It's part of who we are as local school districts. Um, and the solvency of the collaborative is critically important. Um, during the school closure period, uh, much like we are as a school district, the collaborative has been offering remote services to the greatest extent it can uh, through in terms of the professional, uh, excuse me, the professional development, but, but especially for the special education services and consultation services it provides. Um, it continues to is also negotiating with the uh, bus contractor um, with whom they work uh, that provides the out of district special ed transportation to our member districts, including Shrewsbury. Uh, and uh, the board of directors did unanimously uh, endorse uh, the, the desire that each of the member districts continue to support the collaborative financially um, as we move through this school closure process. Uh, we wanna make sure of course that it remains viable and on strong fiscal ground. Uh, now, of course, through the budget uh, that we have this year, the, the school committee has already technically um, authorized uh, through the budget, the payments to the, the special education programming that our students participate in, uh, transportation and so forth. 
Um, however, given the extraordinary circumstances surrounding the pandemic, uh, I wanted to be sure to highlight this partnership with the committee and the community um, to emphasize the importance of maintaining this partnership. Um, and in order to validate this, uh, I am asking the school committee or suggesting um, to approve uh, a motion that you find uh, in your packet um, to authorize uh, us as the district administration to continue to take necessary actions to fund those special education and consultative services that the collaborative provides. Um, certainly, uh, with the understanding that those are being modified during the school closure period, uh, but these, of course, would be within the approved, uh, the already approved fiscal year 2020 budget. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the committee has. Anybody have any questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Okay. May I have a motion to authorize the district administration to take necessary actions to continue the funding of special education and consultation services contracted with the Assabet Valley Collaborative with the understanding that those services are being modified as necessary during the school closure period within the approved fiscal year 2020 budget? So moved. So moved. Second. Here you go. A roll call vote. Dale? Aye. Lindsay? Aye. Jason? Aye. John? Aye. Myself? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have our minutes from our. Does somebody have a question? I just said thank you. No? Okay. Next, we have our minutes from our meeting held on. Oh, sorry, Joe. Okay. <laughs> All right, next we have our minutes from our school committee meeting held on April 15th, 2020. Are there any changes or corrections? I don't see any, those can be marked as accepted as distributed. All right, we do need to go into executive session, this, into executive session for this evening for the purpose of negotiations with some or all of the following, the Shrewsbury Education Association Unit A, Shrewsbury Education Association Unit B, the Shrewsbury Paraprofessional Association, the Shrewsbury Cafeteria Workers, and or non-represented staff, where deliberation in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and for the purposes of reviewing, approving, and or releasing executive session minutes and return to open session only for the purpose of adjourning for the evening. May I have a motion to adjourn to executive session? So moved. Second. Roll call vote is required. Dale? Aye. Lindsay? Aye. Jason? Aye. John? Aye. Myself? Aye. Thank you and good night.